Well, my friends, before we begin today's podcast episode, and by the way, not to toot my own horn, but this one's going to be awesome. It was recorded right before the pandemic began to spread, right before the world changed with COVID-19. It was recorded with a lady I've always respected. Her name is Diane Rehm. It was recorded in front of a live studio audience, and it's just an awesome conversation you're going to love today. You're really going to enjoy this one. But before we get into it, some really good news to share in a season when so many of us are dealing with so much heartache, so much disappointment, so much isolation, and so many things that we just don't have control over. Well, here's one thing we do. Our hope in any given season, our joy regardless of our face, our optimism looking forward, and reflecting all of that is a book that rolls out into bookshelves around the world on May 5th. That's right. Cinco de Mayo, you got something to celebrate, baby. It is called In Awe. That's right. In Awe is rolling out next week. Be on the lookout for it. And as much as I love this book, That has been thoroughly researched. It is incredibly inspirational. It's practical. It's pragmatic. It's the kind of thing that I think will inspire you, but also equip you to take the next step in any season. I wrote it during a time of incredibly low unemployment with markets at all-time highs, and yet it's maybe even more applicable in the season that we currently live. So be on the lookout for it. In Awe. You can learn more about it at readinawe.com. And if that's not enough to get you moving in the direction of that website, let me give you one more piece that should be. You know, during this time, during this crisis, we're trying to figure out organizationally, how can we really make a difference? Not only in, in words, which is powerful, but in deeds. So here's the cool thing I wanted to share today with you, podcast listeners. 100% of profits from the first week of sales for this book in awe are going right into a charity that I love. The charity is called Big Brothers Big Sisters. It's the one right here in my own backyard. I'm a board member here. I'm an active big here. I love the organization. I love the work they do. I love the fact that they commit to bring bigs and littles together to live life better. This is a difficult season to be doing that but that does not mean they're not making a difference right now. In fact, they might be making their biggest difference right now, and you can make a big difference too. So I encourage you to learn more about Big Brothers Big Sisters wherever you are tuning into this podcast. And if you want to support them, consider journeying right now over to readinawe.com because every sale between now and the end of the first week is going directly to them. So let's make a difference together. Let's share love and joy together. And my friends, let's enjoy the journey forward together. Welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. John is the number one national best-selling author of the book On Fire. He's a world-class inspirational speaker, and he's the host of the Live Inspired Podcast. John interviews extraordinary individuals on their life story so that you can wake up from accidental living and more fully live your life story. Here's your host, John O'Leary. Well, hello, my friends on Facebook Live. Hello, Diane Reem, right here live with me. And hello, live studio audience. We welcome you to a very special Live Inspired with John O'Leary podcast. What an honor it is to have one of our heroes in the room. This is a woman whose voice I've been listening to for more than 15 years. Oh, my gosh. It's uh a steady presence in my mornings. It's someone who influences my views. We don't always see, this will shock some of you, eye to eye on topics. And yet the candor and the authenticity that you listen with and then reframe with draws me back to listen again. Thank you. So I wanna give you a little bit of a snapshot of who is with me today at the Live Inspired Studios. Diane Rehm spent almost four decades on air and she represents the very sound of national public radio. She has the unique ability to own a strong opinion on matters, but also the uncommon ability to remain open to someone else's opinion. What an important time to have a perspective like that. She is naturally curious to someone else's perspective and to their point of view. She's been described, I love this one, as the diva of discussions. And a woman who possesses an amazing combination of steeliness, and vulnerability. What a joy it is to have with us live at Live Inspired, my friend, a lady I've looked up to for a long time. Her name is Diane Reem. Diane Reem, welcome to Live Inspired with John O'Leary. 
Thank you, John. What a joy. So my very first question to you is, you spend the majority of your life on this side of the microphone. Which side do you prefer? It's easy on this side because I'm just responding to what you ask. And whatever you ask is fine with me. On your side of the microphone, I tend to over-prepare. And that takes time, as you well know. So uh, for the first few years, I read every single book word for word. I read every article, every document I could find. So no question, it's much easier on this side. Do you still get nervous as we do the countdown? Three, two, one. No. No butterflies anymore. No, no. We'll come back to that in a, uh, later on in our program because I understand you spent a long time with the butterflies circling. You a bet. A lot of anxiety. You bet. Especially after NPR took the program. Right. I mean, and started sending it all over the world. Um, and you bet I had real butterflies. I think, indeed, that may have contributed to my vocal issues, but who knows? You wrote a book recently called When My Time Comes. Read it, loved it, hard to get through. Hard to get through because it's so emotional and you cannot read that book without being moved. You may not agree with everyone's opinion. I thought it was beautiful that you brought on the perspective of people who saw the exact same thing through a completely different lens. Totally. You began that book, though, with the story of your mother's passing. She passed when, and you know, I don't even like to use that word. She died when I was 19. She was 49. She had some sort of liver disease that in the end caused her stomach to look as though she were 11 months pregnant. She was taken to the hospital time after time for draining. And that last time I was there with her and she begged to die. I mean, she just was suffering so very much. And she died on New Year's Day. My father died 11 months later of a broken heart. He was 13 years older than she, and he just did not want to live without her. So death was a factor early in my life. And watching someone suffer and beg to die, beg to be released from pain and suffering, I think is something that stayed with me for a long time. Clearly, and remains with you. And it's something that you've made a point out of visiting with others around and making sure you bring to the forefront of a, of a marketplace that seldom talks about real life and real death. You think it's a topic we should be speaking about much more frequently in our homes, with our ministers, with our rabbis, with our physicians, with our spouses. With our children. I think death is the last taboo that we fear so much I like to ask uh, audiences for any of you here who decide or have decided you're not going to die. Would you raise your <laughs> hands, please? And you see, it's always that nervous little chuckle because we are all going to die. It is part of that life circle. So accepting that, planning for it, talking about what it is you want at the end of life is what I am encouraging people to do. So we'll get to the end of life. I wanna start at the beginning of life. Right. You wrote about your mother's death. You wrote about uh, how agonizing that was for her and for you and for the entire family. I'd like you though to share something that happened in the previous 19 years leading up to that. I know very little about your mother's life other than where she came from, what she left behind. Talk about your mother from a daughter's perspective. What was she like as a mom? I think because my father came here in 1907 
with his entire family. My mother, on the other hand, my father went back to the old country, to Alexandria, Egypt, and plucked her out of an engagement to another man. Brought her here, I think, I speculate, because I really don't know, promising her the moon. I don't think she was happy here, and um, while my dad's whole family, aunts, uncles, cousins, everybody was here for him, and he was the baby of the family. My mom had no one. I think she was depressed. I think um, quite often I would come home and find her sleeping on the sofa. Um, she, her English was not as good as my dad's, um, so that she didn't get involved with school activities at all. The one time she did, she promised to go with parents to take us to the circus. She didn't drive. And as soon as we got there, she had a terrible headache. And I felt so guilty that I had asked her to come. So it, it was not... Um, what you would call a wonderful and warm and happy relationship because I don't think she was happy. And then they told me, the doctor told me when I was 16 that she only had 18 months to live. Um, but she then lived for three years in absolute misery. As the daughter of someone who is seemingly depressed, full of anxiety, not very happy, did you feel as if it was your job to somehow take care of the family and help your mom through the day? At one point when I was 12, my dad had a heart attack. He and his brothers owned a grocery store in Washington and, you know, even during the Second World War, the refrigerator was always quite happily stocked because he did own that grocery store. But then when I was 12, he had a heart attack, could no longer work. So for the very first time in her life, my mother had to go to work. She was a beautiful seamstress. My sister became a cheerleader for the high school we both went to. And she needed a skirt, a pleated skirt. You know what they look like for cheerleaders. And my sister came home with a skirt to show my mom. And within half a day, my mother had made a newspaper pattern and had created exactly the skirt. She had that talent, so she went to work for a local department store in the monogramming department, and she worked until she got sick and could no longer work. My father then began driving a cab. Um, he shouldn't have even done that. But he did, and as I say, they finally died 11 months apart. Fair enough. And I have to confess to you that I had gotten married to an Arab because I am an Arab. Both my mother and dad born in Mersin, Turkey, my dad's family went to Beirut, Lebanon. My mother's family went to Alexandria, Egypt. But we were Syrian Orthodox Christians. So that 
before she died, I knew she wanted me to get married. And there was an Arab suitor. And honestly, I think because I wanted to please her, I did marry him. My mother was lying on the sofa in the living room. The Orthodox priest was there, just family, a friend playing the harmonica as I walked down the stairs. And she died two months later. When you were walking down those steps, what feeling were you having? Most brides have some anxiety, but also most are looking forward to what they're walking toward. I don't think I was. I think... um, I think I was doing what I thought my parents wanted me to do. And when they died, one of the first things I did was to get a divorce. In a sense, their deaths freed me from the constraint of a marriage I really didn't want. And sadly, it was the first divorce the Arab community in Washington, D.C. had ever seen. So I was shunned Mm -hmm. for quite a while until I met my late husband. Now, we were married for 54 years. And when he came into my life and we had our first child, our son, somehow the gates opened wide again. Mom, one job title you've had. You've had others, though. Secretary, homemaker. Which is where I met John Cream at the State Department. Model. Uh, Radio dispatcher. (laughs) Uh, Among others. So my my question, Diane, before radio, what was your favorite job? And it could have been way back when you were 13 or somewhere right before. You know, my father kept saying to me, you're going to be a secretary, so learn to make sure your penmanship is great because that's what you're going to do. So I learned to type. I learned to take shorthand. I was good at it. My first job was as uh, an assistant secretary to the director of the D.C. Department of Highways. And one day he came in and said, Diane, get on that two-way radio and tell the guys about the pothole on 16th Street. So from then on, daily, I would be on that two-way radio. That was my first experience, but that didn't lead me anywhere. I didn't think I was ever going to do radio. You stumbled forward. My, uh, my role these days, Diane, is in radio as an author and as a speaker, primarily as a speaker. And my very first talk 15 years ago, large audience, three in the audience, Pretty successful group. It was three Girl Scouts, and they were in third grade. And it was my very first time sharing my story. And I was so nervous ahead of time that as I made my way to the school building, I walked away from the school building toward the front of the car, put my head against the bumper, threw up three times, put a piece of gum in, and walked back in. And that was my first talk. And then the same anxiety and tension and a bit of unworthiness was in the back of my mind for years for years. One of the things that blew me away in reading your autobiography is you had that same anxiety and that same, in some regards, unbelief in you. Absolutely. When I got the job as host of what was then called Kaleidoscope, first of all, because the station is licensed to the American University. And because I had never been to college, I did not think they would hire me. And then when they did hire me, I thought, I can't possibly 
live up to the expectations of a university. Mm -hmm. I just can't do it. So each morning when I'd get to the studio, I'd sit out in front of the car, in front of the studio, just breathing and trying to talk to myself and thinking I was going to throw up or I have diarrhea or whatever. I mean, it was bad. For how long? Probably a year, two years, <laughs> maybe. You know, it took a long time. What eventually was the turning point? I think my bosses were so uplifting and encouraging of me. It was such a small studio, and my manager would come by each day, and she would say, that was a great <laughs> show today, and boy, I really wanted to know about this. Tell me a little more, Diane. So she would express that kind of interest and encouragement. I think I finally got to the point where I thought, well, if other people think I can do this, maybe I can, and sort of began little by little to believe so we're going to talk about belief audience, whether you're tuning in on air right now uh, through Facebook on the Live Inspired channel or live in our studio. I want you to think through what kids currently are reading about in their history books. So for those of you, Catherine, who are kids or Jack, Patrick, Henry and Grace at home watching right now, listen to some of these names. You've read about them recently in your, your history books. Jane Fonda, John McCain, Barack Obama, Bill and Hillary Clinton, Jimmy Carter, Madeleine Albright, Musician, songwriter, Kenny Rogers, among others. And the list goes on and on and on and on. For many of us, we read about them. We voted or did not vote for them. Uh, we've heard about them. Diane, you sat with all these people and countless others. When you go through your, your Rolodex of interviews, are you, I won't ask a leading question. What are your thoughts around your career? That when each person comes into that studio, what I see is not a bigger than life human being, but rather a human being. Someone, for example, like Hillary Clinton, who came in in that first term that her husband had, who was so warm and so easy to talk with. There is a photograph of her standing behind me looking at my computer so that she can see what I am seeing. This is before we even sat down to do the interview. And then she granted me the only radio interview, walk through of the White House, um, taking me into the kitchen, taking me into private places that I could only describe on the air. I mean, she was a human being. Um, Jimmy Carter, Preston Jimmy Carter, whom I had on the show 11 times, and the last time I had him on, I walked into the studio and he was standing there and he said, come here, <laughs> want to give you a hug. I mean, human beings. So fear was not part of the element with which I encountered these people or blowing them out of proportion. It really was meeting them face to face. Only one bad experience, really bad experience in my whole history of radio. Um, Are you having it right now? <laughs> I'm thinking about it right now. I'm thinking about it right now. Tom Clancy, whose books I'm sure people have read and enjoyed 
came into the studio with his aviator sunglasses on, and um, I put out my hand to shake his. He didn't put out his hand. I thought, well, maybe he doesn't like to shake hands. Took him into the studio, and I thought he'd take his sunglasses off. Instead, he put his elbow up on the table and put his hand up like this. So I thought this is going to be an interesting interview, and I had read his book carefully, as you have clearly read mine. I asked him a first good question with which he could have taken and flown about his book, and his answer was, yep. (laughs) That's a long time slot to fill. Exactly. I asked him one more question. His answer was, nope. So I thought to myself, I've got two choices here. I can just say, Mr. Clancy, it's clear you'd rather not be here. I can just talk to listeners, so why don't you just leave? Or I can open the phones. Maybe he would rather talk to listeners than to me. Luckily, I opted for the second choice. Open the phones. First caller is a man who begins by saying, Mr. Clancy, we love your books. And Clancy is smiling for the first time. But then the caller goes on to say, but you sure are being arrogant with our Diane. And Clancy took off his glasses, threw them across the table and said, oh, no, we're having a wonderful time, aren't we, Diane? And the caller jumped in and said, it sure doesn't sound that way to us, Mr. Clancy. From then on, he was a pussycat. (laughs) So, you know, you make those decisions on the spur of the moment because he's not Tom Clancy, this big-time writer making gazillions of dollars. He's a human being with an ego. Hmm. So you just deal with it. So well said. Thank you. As a nine-year-old, I was burned on my entire body and disfigured physically, but it's who I am. So I never came to know myself as anyone other than the John O'Leary you are seated across from. I think when things physically happen to you later on in life, it can be way more devastating. I had a friend who was in Hollywood, a beautiful person physically, who fell, tripped, got a black eye and a broken nose, and it scarred them for years because they were no longer able to be in public, to be photographed, certainly not to be on film because they were no longer who they once were. Which brings us to 1998 with Diane Rehm, who is a wildly, at this point, successful radio host and a diagnosis that that you receive that's going to change the way you present yourself publicly. Spasmodic dysphonia, which is my strange, strangled-sounding voice, which is caused by some incorrect message from the basal ganglia of the brain to the vocal cords, which causes them to crunch down unnaturally. The diagnosis took six years to get. Finally, at Johns Hopkins, a neurologist and an otolaryngologist said, you have spasmodic dysphonia. I received the first injection of Botox directly into the vocal cords that day. To this day, I continue to receive those injections once or twice a year out in Portland, Oregon, uh, where that Johns Hopkins doctor now practices. Um, I am the luckiest person in the world, and... John, I commend you so incredibly for going on with your life, for continuing 
beyond what those burns must have caused you in your life. I can't imagine. I can't imagine. As we look at it, it's now a blessing. But it takes a long time to get to that point. And interestingly enough, your book, and we're going to jump into this next, begins with the introduction. Uh, the foreword written by another famous author who spoke in about midway through about this little boy that was one of his clients, 10-year-old boy, burned on 85% of his body. I was burned on 98% of my body. And he said what a tragedy it was for this kid to go through life with those scars and that pain. And I thought to myself now as a man who once was that boy, but now as an adult with four little kids and a wife that I just kissed goodbye and I get to return to momentarily, what a blessing it is to have been that little boy, now to be a man on the other side of tragedy. In your book, you call out the tragedies we face, including Parkinson's disease and cancers, and the weight of life as it progresses toward death and how agonizing this can be. And you live this with your husband, Parkinson's disease, John. We could spend hours talking about your sweet John. He sounds like a prince. Oh my gosh, he was. Built like a brick. A Pennsylvania boy, stone uh, worker. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm, he's dancing in my mind right now, and I, I'm, I'm married to a woman. So, like, he, he just sounds like a striking, bright, humble, faithful, beautiful guy. He was born in Paris of American parents. His father, a journalist. His mother, a runway model <laughs> in Paris. Bright red hair, very tall. Um, he was a classics major in college, but then because he knew he'd have to earn a living, turned to the law. Right. And while he served under Kennedy and Johnson and loved those years in government, and that's where we met, when we were both at the State Department, the practice of private practice law, he really hated mm -hmm. because he felt he was simply making money for other company. Right. And he just didn't believe that he was doing useful, worthwhile work. At the same time, one day on a street corner, he saw a man with a card table on the corner asking for help. And my husband was always very curious and walked up to him and found out he had been in the Ceausescu government in Romania, had gotten out was now working for the government here in the United States, but his wife and son had not been allowed to leave Romania. John not only took on his case, but actually went to Romania to meet with the wife and help to bring her back. Um, he did so many things. He, when we first got married, he was not a believer in God. And then he and I were having some difficulty. And he went off to New York to have a visit with his mother. I went off to visit with a friend. And he was walking along Fifth Avenue and stopped in the church of the Doubting Thomas. And all of a sudden, as he put it in his book, he was caught by Christ. And he called me as soon as he got home. He was... I thought he had lost his mind. He was crying and weeping so powerfully. 
because he really didn't know what had happened to him. He was baptized shortly thereafter at the age of 45. How was John different after that baptism and that conversion and that Church of Doubting Thomas experience? He went on to, while he continued to practice law, to earn a degree in theological studies, a master's from Wesley Seminary. He just had a different outlook on life in general. He was always very kind to people, except toward the end, John, when he was in the nursing home with Parkinson's He became very embarrassed at having people see him. Mm -hmm. He felt he had lost all dignity, and he was going further and further into those depths. And I think that's what really got to him. Your husband, your husband John Ream, and my dad shared the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. Uh, my dad has carried this weight for more than three decades now. And wow. many of our live studio audience know my dad. Some of us are related to my father. Wow. And I adore, I just adore my dad. I look forward to writing a book about my dad someday. Good. How brave he is and how he, he carries this diagnosis with such dignity. Um, wheelchair bound and almost without words, but full of dignity. This journey for you and John, how long was it for him from the moment he was diagnosed until he ended up in a retirement community and until he finally got to the point, Diane, dang it, I can't do this anymore. 10 years. 10 years? 10 years. And then he asked to have my daughter, who is a doctor, on the phone, our son, who is a professor of philosophy, there in the room, his doctor and me, and he turned to the doctor and said, I am ready to die. Will you help me? And the doctor had already determined he was within six months of death. Mm -hmm. And the doctor said, because he was in a Maryland facility, legally, morally, ethically, I cannot help you. The only thing you can do is to stop eating, stop drinking water, stop taking medication. And that's what John did. And after 10 agonizing days, he finally died. You share the story of after he made that decision, you come in the following day to visit your husband of 54 years. It's 12 years longer than I've been alive, you've been with the same man and you love him. And you've been through the storms, the ups and downs together. And you come in and you see that his face is rosy and full of life and at peace. Talk about that. And I said, sweetheart, you look wonderful. What have you done? And he said, I've begun the journey. I have not had anything to eat or drink no medication, I'm ready. And I had made him years before a photograph album from his birth in Paris to the end of his college years. And I sat on his bed with my arm around him and we just went through that album I'll never forget that. The day of his death. 10 days after this journey begins, 10 years after it began, and 54 years after it really began, you lay with him that night. Of course, no one's going to sleep when they know their loved one is near passing, near death. Uh, You don't sleep. You begin writing, and eventually you leave just momentarily to go home and shower, feed the dog, and come right back. And I get back. 20 minutes too late. I was not there to hold his hand and say goodbye. 
and that breaks my heart. What is his legacy? Oh, his legacy. His two beautiful, wonderful human beings, our children and our grandchildren. John, you're going to make me cry. <laughs> um, and I talk to him every single day. I remarried in 2017, three years after he died, but I talked to John Ream every single day. Did you and John talk about whether it was uh, possible and appropriate for you to remarry? Never even Never came, came up. up because I was convinced I was never going to remarry. <laughs> I thought, uh, look, I've been married for 54 years. I'm now almost 80 years old. I'm not going to remarry. Who's going to want to remarry at this age? And then a retired Lutheran minister whom I had met 30 years before and spoken to for a total of two minutes, sent me a letter after my book on my own was published um, saying that he too had lost his wife five years previously, and were I ever to be in Florida, he'd love to take me out for a cup of coffee. And I like that. Not a drink, not a dinner, but a cup of coffee. He included his email address, and I sent him, I, I knew the name, but I couldn't picture him at all. Just didn't remember him at all, sent him an email and said, well, as a matter of fact, I have no sense of geography. You have to understand that. I said, I'll be in Orlando, and, you know, if you'd like to come to, I'm making a talk there. He lives in West Palm Beach. It took him three and a half hours to get there. and Hope the coffee was good. There were 1,500 people in the audience, and he was one of 500 who had paid and stood in line for two hours to have me sign his book and have a photograph taken. And as he was walking away, he turned around and looked at me, and for some reason I turned around and looked at him. Something funny happened. I'm a, a morbid and a life-giving way type of guy. I know, unlike some of the audience and some watching and some hearing our voices, we are going to die. Right. So it's the greatest secret we have. Right. I know, because I've almost been there. And every time I look in the mirror, I'm reminded of that, fr that fragile aspect of life. For me, it's inspiring. Wake up and live the best life you can while you're here. Uh, but I also know that I may not have 54 years with my wife. And so I tell her all the time, baby, wear black to the funeral and then, and then put the hair up and go out again because I want her to have a vibrant, life-giving, fun, loving life. And it makes me so happy to know that you had an awesome life with John and now you're having an awesome life with John. With your John. Your current husband. Exactly. It's a beautiful thing. Thank Talk about the book. The book is the result of three years of work on a documentary of the same title. It's called When My Time Comes. About a year after John Ream died, a documentary filmmaker came to me saying that he wanted to create a documentary on medical aid in dying and the right to die movement across the country would I be interested in participating? And, you know, I really didn't hesitate. I was ready to do it. So we spent three years traveling the country, talking with doctors, 
patients, relatives, survivors, priests, ministers, caregivers. And we did at least 45 interviews for the documentary, which will be shown on public television next spring. From that, I took 20 or 25 of those interviews, and that is the book. I wrote an introduction for each of the interviews we did, and then John Grisham was dear enough to do the introduction because he feels as strongly as I that whatever your choice is, it should be yours. If you want God to be the only decider, you should have that right no matter what. If you want everything that medical science can provide, you ought to be able to do that. I support you. And if you choose to have medical aid in dying, I think we each have that right to have that choice. But I am arguing for people to have these discussions in their homes with their children, their families, their doctors, their friends. John, do you know about death cafes around Only the country? Only through you. And then I went to the website to learn more. And they're wonderful. People come together in neighborhoods, in communities, in churches to talk about death, to ensure that death is no longer something we should fear, that it becomes part of the circle of life, that we need to plan for it. We need to, I'm not just talking about writing out your uh, do not resuscitate. I'm talking about what you want at the end of life. Do you want everything? that medical science can offer? Or do you want to be able to say, I've had enough suffering, I'm ready to go, and to have those medical doctors help you? And it's such a hot-button issue. Yeah. So divisive. It's so awkward to even step into for a community that never wants to have a conversation around this. Do you think that's only true, that ability to decide for physical pain, or is it true also for cognitive loss with dementia and Alzheimer's? And, and then thirdly, with the emotional pain that some of us deal with with life, we just, life just is so taxing. It is so hard. I can take it no longer. So at, at, w w when do you have that right in your opinion, and when is it no longer yours? The only time you have that right under current law in nine states and the District of Columbia is when two doctors have declared that you are within six months of death. No Alzheimer's, no dementia, no depression, none of that is in the law. And under no circumstances would a doctor in this country allow for that to happen. Switzerland, the Netherlands, other and now Germany are allowing that to occur because of severe depression, because of anxiety, because of dementia. But in this country, I think certainly in my lifetime, in your lifetime, it's a step too far. Some would say once you begin stepping, it's very hard to stop. Right. And so um, how would you respond to those who say, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry about Parkinson's or cancer or chronic pain, but I have been 
going through life, my entire life with the burden of knowing that I'm not enough, dealing with anxiety, I'm struggling with depression, nobody loves me, and I should have the exact same right that you argued for that your husband should have. It's a mental issue that the medical community and the law is not yet ready to deal with. It's going to be a long time before they do. They're only ready to deal, and it's difficult. Mm -hmm. One of us in five here in the U.S. now has the right to say, I want to die. And if you are within six months of death, you may ask for that medication and with the help of a physician, get that medication, take it, and end your life. But under no circumstances is any doctor in this country about to say the same will be true for someone suffering from depression or anxiety. Mm -hmm. And by the way, pain is not the number one issue for which people have to die. It is the lack of joy in life. That's number one. When a person reaches that point, as John Rehm did, where he could do nothing for himself but lie in that bed, not even read, not even want to listen or watch, Mm -hmm. nothing. I respected how you brought up the opinions of those who felt different than you and John, and you gave them the same amount of space as you gave those who argued for your perspective. And and Diane, I I was moved by your story you found in the audience you've spoken to that you're not always converting the audience members or the listeners to believe what you believe. But without fail, you're reminding them, these are conversations we need to have and not to run away from. All I am encouraging people to do is to talk about this realistically within your own families, with your children, with your parents, with your doctors, with your friends. At an early age... The baby boomers are confronting their own parents' aging process. And some of those parents may not want to talk about it, and maybe the children don't want to either. But it's a conversation we all need to have. I've talked to my own children. I've talked with my grandchildren. My grandson is the last chapter in the book. I won't ask you your favorite chapter. Instead, I might share with you mine. And then we're going to turn this over for the studio audience to ask a couple questions on their mind. You had an old boyfriend who moved out to Colorado who you wrote about near the end of the book, maybe two-thirds of the way through. Would you share with our audience about reconnecting with him and, and, uh, and those conversations that you were invited into near the end of his life? Oh, my. Uh, Bill Roberts and I were high school sweethearts. We went steady for about a year and a half. We went to the high school prom together. We were voted the cutest couple in the graduating class. He was president of that class. He had had spinal meningitis. He was a year older than I, but because of that spinal meningitis, had had to miss a year of school. So he and I were in the same class. He worked at Rocky Flats. And a colleague of his got the same diagnosis, bladder cancer that spread throughout his body and into his bones. And the doctors, he said, were um, 
taking bets, Bill loved to be funny, were taking bets as to whether he was going to have a heart attack first or die of cancer. In the end, we spoke by Skype, and of course, he was on a breathing machine, his wife of 60 years standing next to him. And, you know, we told, we had been communicating ever since we had left high school. By email, he would call me by phone. He kept in touch with lots of friends. He was such a good fellow. And it was very hard because in the end, he did, in fact, have the medication to take his life because he had been declared within six months of death. And his wife, Irene, said to him, Bill, do you want the medication? And he said, no. And he died about a month later. He went slowly. He wasn't communicative toward the end. Now, you see, the difference... His was a peaceful decline. The difference between what he had had and what I want. I want my family with me. I want my husband with me, my grandchildren, my friends. I want us all to have a glass of champagne in the living room talk about what our lives have been like and how fortunate we have all been to be with each other. And then I want to go to my own bed, get into my own bed, have my children, my husband with me, take my medication, tell them how much I love them, and go to sleep. Diane asks all of her guests what a good death looks like. And my final question to you before I turn it over to the studio audience was going to be, Diane Ream, what does a good death for you look like? And you've answered the question. So now I'll ask no no more other than audience live or those tuning in right now through the Facebook stream, what questions might you have for our distinguished guest, Diane Ream? So these are a couple questions from our dear friends tuning in around the world. This one's from Pamela. If you were to live life again, what would you do differently? Not a single thing. I think every single thing I have done has been a part of who I am. I wouldn't change one hour of it. We should all be so lucky. Barbara. Barbara says, Diane, what is the advice that you might have for a woman to find their voice in this millennium? I would like to hear if you have a different point of view given your long time experience. I think you have to find your own passion. I didn't even know what my passion was until after my kids went off to various high schools, I began to think, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? And so I took a course called then New Horizons for Women, and the women around the table all said to me, you ought to be in broadcasting. And I said, well, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. <clears throat> but Within a week of finishing that course, a friend of mine told me about a volunteer work she was doing at this tiny little radio station, and a light bulb went on in my head, and I thought, well, maybe I could do that. And that's how it all began. So I would say to you, just be open to what ever the possibilities are, and be ready for that possibility when it comes along. You never know where it's going to lead you. 
Our friend Shelly online wants to know, since everyone in the limelight, Diane, has to deal with criticism, what process have you found to be most effective when you face harsh feedback or email trolls? Um, I have not had that kind of experience to any degree because, remember, I left in 2016. I'm still doing two podcasts a week, so I'm on Twitter and Facebook and all of those now. But perhaps because of my age, I don't know. People have not attacked me in particularly harsh ways. I mean, they've criticized me. They've said, well, how come you did this or why didn't you ask this? I mean, and they're good questions. So I think I just take them as they come and hope that I can do better. I wish we were all able to handle critique and that ability of staying calm, like all of our politicians are modeling these days, and doing better. Can you imagine if either side of the aisle, rather than fighting and throwing the garbage back, you stayed calm and determined instead to do better? John, what do you do? I'm weak. So I see the criticism and the trolls when they show up on my site, and I'm on a post or a Facebook. You you may see hundreds of likes, and I'm immediately attracted to the three thumbs down on a book that you might write. You may see hundreds and hundreds of five-star reviews, and my eyes immediately go five, four, three, two, and down to the ones, right. to the three that said this book is garbage. It came in the mail broken. It's like, well, that's not even my fault, but I somehow take that personally. So the human condition of being broken is one that I wake up with every day, and I'm trying to stay calm and do better. Maybe I should take the Diamory <laughs> medicine. We have two more, and then audience, we're gonna ask a few of you. So get ready to rock and roll. Here we go. This one comes from... Sandy, what has been your most memorable interview throughout your storied career and why? Probably because I loved him so much, the interview with Fred Rogers. Yes. My sweet. That's so good. Oh, my sweet. He starts playing the piano halfway through the interview. He does, and he's using all of his voices. (laughs) He's, He's... just the dearest man in the world. I, when I was at a home with the kids, used to save my ironing until the end of the afternoon after the kids got home from school and set up the ironing board in my sewing room and put the kids down in front of the television set waiting for Mr. Rogers to come on. I think he was one of, if not the greatest teacher of humankind that I have seen in my lifetime. Teaching children, teaching adults, teaching every single one of us what it is to be kind, what it is to be human, what it is to be afraid, what it is to lose faith, what it is to be racist, what it is to lose someone you love to death. The day or two after I did the interview in the mail came this tiny little book by Fred Rogers that has a mirror on the front of it. And the book is titled, You Are Special. And I opened the book, and in the book, Fred had written, Diane, you really are special. Love, Fred Rogers. I have that book on my nightstand. And when I'm kind of feeling down, that's the little book I look at. To the other friends of Fred Rogers and Diane Reem, anyone else want to weigh in with a question that you have? Jamie Hassmeyer. 
Hi, Jamie. Hi. Such an honor to be here with Thank you. you. Um, and thanks, John, for and extending the invitation. Um, started listening to your show when I right after college, and I moved to Chicago and had to travel all over the Midwest. So you were my companion who kept me awake behind the wheel. And through that, I just got to know you and appreciate you and trust you to ask the questions that I didn't even know needed to be answered. So I am just humbled by what you've given all of us throughout your career, so thank you for that. Um, and I'm curious to know, with this book, and my apologies, I, I've yet to read it, but I will, um, what, as you're going through your career, and you've given us so much as far as a legacy, um, did, you, did it ever dawn on you that you would write a book like this, or did it, it took John and what you went through with him and do you feel like this is part of your legacy? What you're leaving us is, is something to ponder and really challenging us, like you've challenged all your guests in the past. I think that this is the most important book I've ever written. I never imagined that I would write it I never thought it was something that would be part of my career. It is the last book I'm going to write. I have no intention of writing any more books. You said that about marriage four years ago, too, so I, I don't trust Diane Reem at all on anything anymore. But I do think it's important, if only, to get this discussion going. Such an important one, not only for us as individuals, but for the whole country to recognize that this has been such an off-limits topic and something we each need to confront not only in our own lives, but in the lives of those around us. So I'm really humbled by the reaction it's gotten. You asked me what made me nervous. When this book came out, I was really nervous. I was thinking, oh, my God, people are going to hate it. People are going to say, why did you write this? Who are you to write this book? Who are you to talk about death in this way? But I am stunned by the reaction um, yesterday at the St. Louis Public Library. I was stunned that there were more than 800 people there who came. They knew what the subject matter was. It wasn't as though I was there to tell happy stories. <laughs> so I do think that this book and this film really... But my greatest legacy are my two children. They are, and my grandchildren, they are my life. Mary Mern. Um, Diane, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. And John, thank, thank you. you so much for including me. Um, my son's paternal grandmother chose to end her life. She lived in the Netherlands. Um, and I would tell people that, and they'd say, oh, those Dutch, they're so liberal, they're so, I mean, that's, I know them. And then when you said, you're of Egyptian and Syrian descent, I immediately went there. I've spent my life in travel. I know those people. They are warm and wonderful. I can see <laughs> your Egyptian face the moment you said it. And when you spoke of your sons and your grandchildren, that was when you got teary because that's so meaningful. So for the children in this world who don't ever get out of their own little bubble, <clears throat> how do you encourage them to know other people, to respect other cultures, to 
have an open mind so that they can go out into this world as better ambassadors and care about what's going on in Syria and what's going on for the underprivileged and for all the little kids who, who could make a difference. How do you do oh, that? Oh, boy. <clears throat> First of all, it's going to take a good example from the top. And I do mean not only parents, but I mean at the top of our government. And my concern right now is that that respect for people who are different from us may not be receiving that respect from those at the highest level of our government. And that is an example, I fear to tell you, that these young people are following. So it has to come down to the parents. It has to come down to honestly saying again and again to our children how much it matters, how we treat other people, people whose skin color may be different from ours, people whose language may be different from ours. I cannot believe the sights of the little children in Syria who are being killed, are dying a freezing death, who are victims of various wars throughout the world. And yet here in this country, we have little children who don't have enough to eat every day. And somehow we as adults, even if our leaders are not, speaking out about that and taking responsibility for that. We as human beings, whether we are parents or not, can do something. I see that Whole Foods is now providing when we bring our own bags to the grocery stores, we can donate that nickel to go to foods for hungry children. I think whatever we can do, whatever we have the opportunity to do, is a teaching moment about those who don't have what we have and how we can help make their lives better. Thank you, Thank Mary. You. How about two more questions from the audience and then we're gonna wrap up and make sure that Deanna saves her voice and gets on her flight and has an awesome Saturday going forward. So I'm looking for two more questions from our live studio audience. We have one from my friend, Dan. Dan and I were talking about the very subject you just answered and spoke to yesterday about the dignity of human life and how regardless of policies, we need people whose first opinion is love the one in front of you. We gotta figure out the right policy here. But my gosh, where's the compassion? Where's the compassion for a child? So Dan, uh, your question, my friend. Yeah, pleasure to be here and to thank um, you, Dan. be a part of this. So, thank you. So maybe some parenting advice, as my 14-year-old will get embarrassed here. Um, <laughs> but there's this cult of personality that's going on right now, both sides, that I, it's new to me. You know, I've read about past historical figures where Educated people would rise up, and uneducated people would rise up to follow people. But we we definitely are shouting at each other in long form conversation, which I gravitate towards on media. I I, I really love it, and I, that's why I adored your show so much. But how about for this generation next to me, the the need not to maybe pick sides so quickly and to listen and to have 
this longer form conversation. Do, what is your, I'm going to ask this in a different way, about your industry that you are in and came from. Is that going to continue? We have podcasts, we have NPR, we have these, but the art of long form conversation, is that something you're optimistic about in the future? About And really your industry. I, we've talked about a lot of things today. I'm just, as she grows up, is this something that you feel optimistic about or maybe not so? You know, I'm really not sure where the industry is going. I think because younger people have quicker change of subject matter in front of them, the attention span growing shorter, moving so quickly from one thing to another, I'd be fascinated to hear from your lovely daughter how much time you spend on your iPhone, how much time you spend talking with your friends as opposed to texting them or how much time do you spend in conversation? I don't know. I think it's like sometimes easier to just text and stuff. But if it's my close friends, of course I can spend hours just talking. And stuff. Yeah. Talking on the phone or talking in person? In person, yeah. Well, that's good. Yeah, but, but I'd say like for other people, like who I'm not as close to, it's easier just you know go like talk through a screen. Yeah, I think that misunderstandings of personality and subject matter and intent are greater when it is not in a face-to-face conversation. Um, And I think young people are both stronger and more fragile these days because of that kind of communication, which I think doesn't lead to in-depth understanding of who that other person is. I don't know whether it's a cycle and whether we're going to get weary of the lack of communication. I mean, I've heard that families can sit at the dinner table and not talk to each other, actually be texting at the table. Does that happen at your dinner table? Uh, we, we put the hammer down. <laughs> I'm but glad to hear that. It, does, it can show it up. It can show sure. up. And you can look at the eyeballs, you know, looking at the phone. It's an addiction for everyone. It's, that's it's not an kids. addiction. It's and I can tell you that some of the dinners that we used to have, and we had dinners every night, whether John Ream was there or not, some of those conversations with those two kids weren't the happiest. But it meant we were there together. And I think that either breakfast or dinner for the whole family is so important to be together in that way to share frustrations, to the anger gets very uncomfortable, but it's real, it's real communication. It shapes thinking. But as for the future of the broadcast industry, one thing I think you're going to see gone before long are the nightly news programs. ABC, NBC, and CBS. I think their viewership has gone so far down. And frankly, they're having more fires and more automobile accidents 
than they are having national and international news. So I think you're going to have more cable news programs with lots more talking heads, which means you're going to have fewer in-depth discussions about important subjects that are happening all over the world. I think we are becoming increasingly isolationist. I think our world is becoming a smaller one, and I worry a lot about that. So I'm glad your viewership your listenership is all over the world because you are speaking to people who care about what you, John, have to say. Diane Ream, I have the honor of asking you the final question of the entire audience, and it is one that we ask all of our guests. It's the final question of the Live Inspired Questions, and it is, Diane Ream, it has been said that all great people can have their lives summed up in one sentence, how would you like your one sentence to read? I have received the greatest love from so many people in my life that I am the luckiest person in the world. My friends, I want to thank you for tuning in to this episode. Whether you are live, you are in this room with us, you are listening to the podcast. We have one of the luckiest people in the world with us, and I feel like the luckiest guy in the world being able to share your life story with them today. So Diane Ream, thank you for being a model of love in a marketplace that is starving for it. So my friends, for this time, and until next time, this is Diane Ream. I and John O'Leary, and today is your day. Live inspired.